Good evening, everyone. My name is David Bob. I'm the director of the Kirby Center at Hillsdale College. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to tonight's first principles on First Friday's lecture by Dr. Larry Arn, 12th president of Hillsdale College. Whether you're with us here on Capitol Hill, in the Kirby Center's Steve and Cindy Van Andel Lecture Hall, or watching via webcast, we are glad that you've joined us tonight. One year ago, Hillsdale formally opened the doors of the Kirby Center. Some 40 years ago, the college sent its first student intern to the nation's capital as part of the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program. 167 years ago, Hillsdale College began its existence with a statement of gratitude. Grateful to God for the inestimable blessings resulting from the prevalence of civil and religious liberty and intelligent piety in the land, and believing that the diffusion of sound learning is essential to the perpetuity of those blessings. The founders of the college stated that, the, that Hillsdale would be committed to best develop the minds and improve the hearts of the students. Hillsdale College operates today with this end firmly in mind so that we as citizens, young and old alike, might live worthy of those inestimable blessings. In formulating the college's mission, Hillsdale's founders drew deeply upon the wisdom of America's founders. And it is that wisdom tonight which Dr. Arne will address as his topic. His forthcoming book has a short title and a long subtitle. The Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection Between the Declaration and the Constitution and What We Risk by Losing It. It promises what it, for its readers what his students at the college receive in class a careful consideration of what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a citizen, and what is, stake, what is at stake today for our nation. To introduce Dr. Arn this evening, I now ask to come forward Hillsdale College senior and politics major Nicholas Youngstrom. This semester, he's as part of the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program, interning in the office of House Speaker John Boehner. Nick. Hello, everyone. Dr. Larry P. Arne became the 12th president of Hillsdale College in 2000. He received his bachelor's at Arkansas State University and his master's and PhD uh, in government from the Claremont Graduate School. From 1985 to 2000, he's, he was served as president of the Claremont Institute. He is the author of Liberty and Learning, the Evolution of America's Education and the Founder's Key, which is the topic of today's speech. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Arne. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, David. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're here in Washington, D.C., which, as you know, is the center and creator of everything in the universe. <laughs> and so I thought I should direct our attention elsewhere. Uh, first of all, the chairman of our board is here, and uh, he's about the greatest guy there ever was. And his name is William J. Broadbeck, and he's right there. And, uh, <laughs> The second thing is sad. Uh, we're here in the Steve and Cindy Van Andel Lecture Hall, dedicated a year ago. And uh, Cindy Van Andel was, I am sorry to say, one of the most beautiful 57-year-old women I ever saw in my life. If you can look at the picture back there, it's recent. She's a gorgeous person. She's uh, kind and uh, caring and sweet, and everyone testifies to her goodness. And she died four days ago. And uh, her, her husband, Steve, she's a 1975 graduate of Hillsdale College. Uh, her husband, Steve Van Andel, who's uh, chairman of, Van, of Amway and was the president of the United States Chamber of Commerce, is a member of our board, is a member of our executive committee, is a, a wonderful man. And we send him our condolences. She died of cancer in six weeks' notice, and uh, we grieve for that very much. Uh, to prove that Washington, D.C. is not the center nor the maker of the known universe, I can tell you that the most important thing that's happening in the country tonight is happening in San Bernardino, California, because there the Hillsdale College Charger ladies volleyball team <laughs> uh, 
is in the semifinals for the national championship. <laughs> At uh, 10.30 Eastern Time, 7.30 Pacific Time, you can go to the NCAA website and navigate to the women's volleyball page, and you'll find a link there, and you can watch the match for free. And you will marvel. I mean, I, Cal State San Bernardino is the undefeated number one ranked team in the country and they're the host of the tournament. And that's who we're playing tonight to see who gets to the final. And they look really fearsome to me. But our girls will look uh, both beautiful and fearsome to you, I think. <laughs> and I'll tell you something odd about those girls so I can brag on them a little bit. Uh, they're all students, these girls. And the guarantee of that is that radical thing that we do at Hillsdale College about half our curriculum, a little more than half, is made up in the core curriculum. And that is the study of the great books and the natural sciences and the languages. And uh, it's very difficult. And everybody has to take it and it doesn't make any difference who you are. And that means come to Hillsdale College, you gotta be a student. So those lovely, powerful girls that you'll watch on the thing, if you go look, and they'll be a lot more entertaining than I will be tonight, uh, they're very smart. And if they weren't, they'd flunk out. So go, girls, do great. And I'm not finished uh, deriding Washington yet. There's still uh, one more thing I have to say. Uh, there's something you're forbidden to do in Washington now, and nobody knows how we became forbidden to do it. It just happened. There was a time when everybody did it, long about this time of year, and then you couldn't do it anymore. And if you do it, it's kind of crass. It's not quite right to do it. You can uh, surmise that I'm about to do it, whatever that thing is. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to call attention to the fact before I do it that I'm not supposed to do it. And that will lead me into what I want to say to you tonight. Uh, I can tell you the reason why I'm going to do it. There are three reasons, and they are the three purposes of Hillsdale College. Uh, Come to find out the college was founded in 1844, as D. Bob said, sorry, Dr. David Bob, the director of the, one of the vice presidents at the college, his name Richard Payway, he's a big, tall, long, thin guy, so I call him Mr. Peewee. So D. Bob said that uh, we have this mission at Hillsdale College written before the Civil War. It's very beautiful. And one of my points is going to be that uh, beautiful things are the most important things there are. They matter more than anything else, and they are also the most commanding and compelling things there are. And I'm going to argue that it is the deprivation of the beautiful things that is the cause of the despotism that is surely coming upon us, except that we're going to stop it because of the power of beautiful things. And our college was founded in service of these beautiful things, and all of the marvels that it's worked in its 170 years, including the marvel of this building, a recent marvel, including the marvel of that painting, a recent marvel, including every lovely thing you see around us, was called forth by these beautiful things. And the college was built upon precisely three of them. And they are contained in one sentence, the opening sentence of the college's founding document. As I say, it's a beautiful document. People have died for the meaning of that document, people from our college. They risked their lives for the meaning of that document. Two of them were chosen to bear Lincoln's body from the Springfield Railway Station to his grave because they had risked mortal injury at Gettysburg and won the Congressional Medal of Honor there. In the name of the principles of that document, and the principles, as I say, are just three. And they are, by the way, just like the principles of our country. The first principle is that uh, we stand up for what we call civil and religious freedom. That's uh, stated in the first sentence. And that, that, that good, I can tell you, is America's gift to the world. First realized here, actually, as George Bush said better than I once, it's not America's gift to the world, it's God's gift to man. We love freedom at Hillsdale College, including the religious kind, and for that reason, We've always been open to everyone. This room and this broadcast is always open to everyone of any faith if they're a person of goodwill. And you will get a Christmas card from us, and it's called that. And it contains a quote from George Washington on it every year, and the quote is from the first letter that a chief executive of any country 
ever wrote to some Jews, greeting them as equal citizens, outside Israel, that is. It is now no more, he says, that we speak of religious toleration as if it were by the indulgence of some that others enjoy their inherent natural rights. That's the first purpose of our college. It's the reason we stand up for freedom. It's the reason that we've always believed that you can't take account of anybody's color when you do things like admit them to college because skin color is not a qualification to think. And we've always done that, always fought for that. Some of those people who died for the Union Army in the Civil War had heard Fred Douglas give a speech on our campus. If you look at a book of photographs of Fred Douglas, one of the most famous of them, any good book, was, is a photograph that was taken in Central Hall, which still stands on our campus. That's the first. The second, it says, the articles, is that we stand for intelligent piety. That means we don't like impiety, and we don't like dumb piety. <laughs> God is the kind of being that it would be really good to know something about. And if you study hard enough, you can figure out some things about him. In fact, some of the greatest proofs for the existence of God are rational alone. And those proofs tend to strengthen faith. And our college, it says in these same articles that begins with the devotion to civil and religious freedom and intelligent piety, that the teaching of the Christian faith by precepts and examples shall remain a conspicuous aim of our college. And it is that today and it shall be that tomorrow. And the third thing about the college that you need to know is that it says that sound learning is necessary to the preservation of these blessings of civil and religious freedom and intelligent piety. And what is sound learning? It names what it is. It's learning that is literary, scientific, and theological in its divisions. And it's learning that improves the hearts and develops the minds of the students. In other words, it produces through its operation the moral and the intellectual virtues. Now, I'm gonna claim, after I do this thing that I'm not supposed to do, that it is actually the loss of that kind of learning that is responsible for the impending death of freedom in our country. And that to get that back is the only thing that can call us back to the preservation of that freedom. Merry Christmas. Christmas brings up the eternal and the urgent. It is about the contact of God with earth. One of the two contacts in the Christian faith. And it is this uh, connection and difference between the eternal and the urgent that is at issue today in American politics. It's easy to say, and it's true, if you had to name what made the United States of America if you reasoned about it for a few minutes, you'd have to come up. Any list of five would have to include two things. And one is the Declaration of Independence and the other is the Constitution of the United States. And those two things are different in their nature. Because have you ever thought about the difference between them? The difference is obvious on its face, this book that I've written. By the way, you won't, I don't know, I, I think I'm not supposed to say that you won't need to read it if you listen carefully tonight. <laughs> For, on behalf of my publisher, I say, you must still read the book <laughs> on pain of strapping. I say there's a connection between them, but the connection is not obvious. And it's very commonly divine, de denied because, first of all, have you ever noticed the Declaration of Independence is very beautifully written, and the Constitution of the United States is not. Do you ever read it? Do you ever think about that when you read them? I mean, the, the preamble to the Constitution is pretty good, but there isn't anything quite like the claim that there are laws of nature and of nature's God, that these entitle us to rights that are fundamental and apply to every one of us whenever and wherever we are born. That's a very remarkable thing to happen. And it speaks exactly and precisely and repeatedly in the name of eternity. And it's in a very urgent situation that it does this, but that's what it does. It's, uh, it's incredible 
the scope and breadth of the thing. And that is not as incredible as the height of the thing. Never been anything in politics done quite like that. Of course, it's a very dramatic thing to have done because it ends with this death pledge. If the beginning is universal and grand and elevated all the way up to heaven, the end of it is in that room, you know, maybe a time and a half as big as this room where 55 or so people are gathered and where they mutually pledge to each other their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. I have to interrupt myself and say that I just saw walk in here one of my students who has recently graduated from Yale Law School, and he's come here tonight to remind him what the Constitution of the United States means. <laughs> Hey, Morell. <laughs> See, the Alumni Association will be all over him there from, from Yale. So that's the Declaration, right? And what happens in the Constitution? What happens in the Constitution is there's all these details. There's seven articles. You know, the senators will be this age and served this long and represented this way and on and on and on it goes, right? and there's bills of attainder and coining money and all that stuff, and it's not glorious. It isn't. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, is that not complete and dispositive and eternal? And by the way, it's because the Constitution differs from the language of the Declaration that an opportunity has been found, an opportunity to sever them, to divide the one from the other. I have a quote that I like that explains how it does. This is from Joseph Ellis, a historian. Do you guys know who that is? He's good. He's a very good guy, I think. He must be a wonderful man. I don't know him. But this piece of writing here I'm about to read to you is indefensible. Here's what he writes. He follows, by the way, most historians in writing this. There were really two founding moments. The first in 1776, which declared American independence, and the second in 1787-88, which declared American nationhood. By the way, I'm not going to talk about it, but that sentence by itself doesn't work. The Declaration of Independence is the seminal document in the first instance, the Constitution in the second. The former, the Declaration, is a radical document that locates sovereignty in the individual and depicts government as an alien force, making rebellion against it a natural act. Now, I swear that this fellow is a teacher in a major university, a college, actually. The latter, the Constitution, is a conservative document that locates sovereignty in that collective called the people, makes government an essential protector of liberty rather than its enemy, and values social balance over personal liberation. Now, the consequence of that kind of talk, by the way, because if it's really true that there were two foundings and one is about the eternal rights of man, and the other is about the specific structure and manner in which we will be governed, and they're not connected, think what follows automatically. It means we can organize our government any old way we want to. The Speaker of the House two years ago was asked by a journalist, you can hear a recording of the interview on the internet now, the journalist is from CNN, I'll send you the reference if you ask me. Where in the Constitution do you get the authority to require a person to buy health care? And the response was, quote, are you serious? Are you serious? Now, by the way, on the Sunday afternoon when they passed the, whatever that dang thing is called, patient protection and affordable something, something, the Obamacare bill. Nancy Pelosi read with great respect from the Declaration of Independence. 
She got that wrong too, but she admires that thing, right? She gets to make it to mean whatever she wants it to mean. But the Constitution, by the way, to which she personally swore an oath as a condition of holding office, is an afterthought or a negation. And that's made possible by the fact that there were two founding moments. The one, a radical document that locates sovereignty in the individual and depicts government as an alien force. Now, the Declaration of Independence is a little less than 1,500 words long. And it is divided into three sections. And the first section is a proclamation of some universal principles. And the second section is some charges against the king. And those are very important. I'm going to talk about those a few, for a few minutes. And the third section is about uh, implementing the thing. That is to say, we hereby declare that this thing means this thing, all this stuff we said before and we are prepared to die for it. That's the end. Universal, particular, particular. That's the structure of the Declaration. About 1,500 words long. That's about twice as long as an op-ed article in the Wall Street Journal. In other words, it's not a great feat of scholarship to master its words. Anybody who hadn't read it could do it tonight before they go to sleep. The former document is a radical document that locates sovereignty in the individual and depicts government as an alien force, making rebellion against it a natural act. I can't find it. The first charge against the king in the list of 17, he has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. I think what it means that Thomas Jefferson, in listing the reasons that justify the rebellion, picks that as the first one. In other words, we are not rebelling because government is an alien force. We are rebelling because it has not been provided to us. In other words, exactly opposite the point and explicit and hidden there, buried in a vast document of fewer than 1,500 words. Now, it's not just that one accidental thing. It's over and over, it says it. What is the first right that is proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence? I just recited it. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them with another, for one people, a people that's in the plural, right? It's not an individual right, it's a right of a people. And to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature, a people is entitled to form and provide government for itself. And so that means, by the way, that it's obvious and it's profoundly true in every line because there's no line in the Declaration of Independence that one can read to interpret it to say that government is an alien force. The Declaration of Independence is interested in government and it's interested, therefore, necessarily in how the government should be arranged. And come to find out that's important, and I'll tell you why it's important. Because we've gotten ourselves into the most remarkable mess these days. Are you aware? Uh, Merry Christmas. It, <laughs> the nature of the mess goes this way. The part of the Constitution that we celebrate the most is Article 1, Section 8. And Article 1, Section 8 lists the things that the Congress can do. And so to return to the Constitution is to return to those things. But to return to those things is impossible, at least in the short or intermediate term. And the reason is, education is not among those things. And health care is not among those things. And retirement benefits is not among those things. And welfare is not among those things, right? 
And that, by the way, I just named most of the government of the United States. And we have made enormous investments in those things. And we can't really lose the investments. I mean, you know, we, we, it is true, they have very significant net deficits, those things. But there's been a lot of assets put into them, too. And so the American people are not going to vote, and ought not to vote, by the way, to simply dissolve all those things overnight. And that means if you're a constitutionalist, how are you going to go about being that? I don't know. Well, actually, I tell you, I do. And in a minute, you will. Because I thought about that for a long time. And I thought, there needs to be something we can do that sets us on the road back to where we need to be. And since we're not going to abolish Medicare, you know, the, the Paul Ryan plan, which, you know, I adore that guy. I, and I, you know, it's not my business to support or not support the Paul Ryan plan. I haven't read the dang thing. Although, you know, I know its main outlines. But if you know its main outlines, you know it's not justified by Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. So what are you going to do if that comes up for vote? You're going to vote for it or not? And I guess if I were in the Congress, I would. So what can you do? Is there something about the Constitution that has a dignity today that we could support today? And come to find out, there's a constitutional understanding written in this middle section of the Declaration of Independence, and it specifically emphasizes the main features of the Constitution as it was later written. So the Declaration of Independence is interested in government, and it explains how it ought to be set up. Isn't that something? Did you ever hear that before? Me neither. So now I've lost my specs and I've lost my place, but I'll get straightened out. I'm going to name three things that are constitutional in the Declaration of Independence that seem to me, according to it, necessary to free government. And by the way, notice the character of these things. Because the way the Declaration of Independence is written, it begins by an assertion that we humans, in our equality, that means above the beast and below the divine, that we humans have a natural authority to organize government according to the way we want. And then it goes and says, we're right to do this in these circumstances because the king has done these things. And it doesn't say, it doesn't say he did them after he agreed not to do them. He, it's just the fact that he did them that makes them wrong. Any time such things are done, they are invasive of the rights of man. And that list is very pregnant with meaning for the shape of a constitution. If you just read, read it, and here's what one of them is. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. It's not the only one. That's a famous one, right? Don't you like that one? By the way, thank God nothing like that's going on today. Because <laughs> we'd be in a world of hurt if something like that was happening now. In fact, by the way, the richest society in the history of man by a lot teeters on insolvency. And what were they worried about back then? What had been going on, right? Why did the king do that? The story of the revolution is replete with the reason. The point is, in 1763, the British won a, a whacking big war. And they became the great world power. And they decided, we're going to run these colonies. They've been costing us a lot. We're going, to, we're going to govern these things. And so they started telling them what they were going to have to do. And by the way, they started passing laws that kings had been beheaded for trying to pass in British history to apply to the, to the Americans. And the Americans said, wait, you can't do this. 
And so the king did what they do. He passed a bunch of taxes and he used it to hire a bunch of people to force them, right? And so now the government is going to overwhelm the society. And do you think that didn't make them angry? He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution. By the way, the claim is made by Thomas Jefferson that the colonies already have a constitution and they have one. Unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts for quartering large bodies of troops among us. So in Boston Harbor, this big, these sailing ships come in. And what gets off them? Except soldiers with bayonets clanking and a writ that says that we get to stay in the barracks of your militia. And if that won't hold us, we get to stay in your public houses. And if that won't hold us, we get to stay in your homes. So you see, the government is to overwhelm the private society. And I want you to understand, I'm going to make a lot of that fact. This is to be the first great liberal society in all of history, the first great free society. And the first condition of that is that the free society be large and the government be small. Now across the street at the Heritage Foundation, they keep these numbers better than I can keep them, and when they tell me what they are, I can't remember them. So forgive me if I get them wrong, but I don't think I will. I think the gross domestic product of the United States is about $15 trillion. Matt Spaulding's there, he's laughing. If I get this wrong, but Matt, Matt's not the kind of guy who'll know either. I think it's about $15 trillion. And I think that st state, federal, and local spending is close to $7 trillion. And if I'm not mistaken, half of 15 trillion is seven and a half. And Obamacare is coming. And is that not said to be 12% of the GDP or something like that? Can you see that it's possible that the government might be about to become larger in economic terms than the private society? And by the way, that's not constitutionalism. Because how's the Constitution itself written? Except that the powers that are not delegated are held by the people, and they have only given certain ones, and that's the whole structure of the Constitution. But I'm saying that a breach of that fact is one of the causes of the American Revolution. We should have a liberal society. And that means a large and thriving and vibrant private sector. For example, liberal arts colleges. You know, ours was started in 1844, and that makes it, you know, about two-thirds of the way back in age. It means a lot of them were started before. And you know, they made it on their own until about 1965 and thought they were doing a great service to country. You know, I'm saying we had about 100 boys at the Battle of Gettysburg. And when Joshua Reynolds said to his adjutant, we're going to run down that road, and we're going to get there in time, and two-thirds of them were dead by nightfall, it means 100 students from a little bitty liberal arts college that nobody had ever taught anything military to. They just taught them to love freedom like today we do that they were in that bunch and they ran down that road and most of them died. Now, the government didn't pay any money to get that to happen, but it was right that it didn't because the government actually belongs to the people. It is our responsibility. It is not some large thing from which we take. It is there to be there for us. And so the first precept of constitutional rule is that we should have a limited government and for goodness sake, couldn't we agree that the government ought not to be larger than the rest of the society? And if a person couldn't agree to that, then he would have to admit that he is not in favor of liberal government.
But the Declaration of Independence says that we have a right to that, and it says that if we are, de if that is deprived, if we are deprived of that, it says that we declare to such people who attempt to do that our independence, and we will hold them in peace, friends, and in war, enemies. Once you have a liberal society, two additional marvels become possible. They're the most awesome thing, and they never happened anywhere in human history until they happened here, not either one of them. The first one is, if it's true that there's this big society and they can own the government, then something becomes possible that's not possible otherwise. And that is, the authority over government can be outside government. You see, sovereignty. James Madison says that. First time in history, sovereignty, that is to say the legitimate title to rule, is entirely located outside the government. And then government can be, and this is my second point, the first is limited with sovereignty outside. The second one is the government can be representative. And that has some big benefits that are simply huge. And the main ones are two. The, the, the first one is, in the government, and, and remember, it's the position of the Declaration of Independence that the government needs to be powerful, big enough to win wars, big enough to protect us from Osama bin Laden by killing that man, which is what he needed. You know, he's a much better fellow than he used to be. <laughs> but if the power to control it is outside, then everybody working in that powerful thing can work for someone outside. That's the first benefit. But the second one, as they say in Sunday school, is like unto it. And that is, I'm, I'm going to close by saying why you have to have all these arrangements according to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But a little portent is just simple. If there's a problem with the government being too powerful, that's because the government is constituted by people. But we're people too. So that means we shouldn't be too powerful either. And if we are sovereign, but we're in an entirely representative uh, uh, system, we can't do anything today except argue and grump and carry on like I'm doing right now. But that's good for us because it means that we get used to thinking before we act because we have to wait for election time. You know, two months ago, we might have elected Herman Cain president. Probably not now. And I'm, you know, I don't mean to criticize him. He was just on the campus. I'm just saying people got a minute to think about it. And facts were revealed. Or maybe they were. I don't really know. And, and, and so we can chew on that. We can think before we act, and that's good for us. But by the way, think what it means about the liberal society, because if you set things up that way, as Madison says, that was done for the first time in history in the United States of America, it does mean that the only way that the sovereign can control the government is through elections. Whereas in Athens, the people would meet and cast a vote. Or in England, the king was sovereign, and he would be the executive branch. In our case, the only way we can do it is we wait for elections. But by the way, what's going on with elections? The government's very big now, isn't it? And its retainers are very big players in elections. Another reason why you need a liberal society, because you could see how if the elections are dominated by people inside the government or with interests connected to the government, sovereignty could move inside the government. So you see, that's a fundamental constitutional arrangement, and it is threatened by the growth of government. It's a purely representative form made possible by a liberal society where the government is not so big that it can send swarms of officials to eat out our substance and harass our people. But by the way, the third thing is simple, and that is, once it's a representative form, then it can delegate the authority of the people to different places. And what becomes possible because of that?
separation of powers. And you know, about both representation and separation of powers, neither the Declaration of Independence nor the Constitution can shut up for a minute. Many of the offenses that the king has worked are interfering with representative assemblies. And he even, they even accuse him of this. He says, okay, I won't let any law be passed to take care of this problem you've got unless you give up the right to representation. And, he sa and, the, and Jefferson writes of that formidable only to tyrants. And he also writes of it incapable of annihilation. It must go back to the people if there's no law to, del to, to set up representation. They, they take up the, the power to govern directly then. And so if you have representation, you can have separation of powers. Now, did you ever count the clauses of the Constitution and think what they're about? There are seven. One of them is about how you ratify the Constitution. One of them is about how you amend the Constitution. And one of them is about the transition from the Constitution to the Articles, from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. And that leaves four that are about the regular operations of the government. Now, in the Declaration, they're very critical of the king because he keeps interfering with judges, for example. That's the worst offense. The worst single thing that the, that, that the government can do is get between a judge and a citizen. Because you see what that protection is and how sacred that is. If the, if the Congress passes a law, but it can't execute it, it takes somebody elected by some other means to execute it. If that happens, that's protection. But then if the person in the executive branch reaches out his hand and grabs you and says, I'm going to put you in the pokey and take your property, you need a judge. And he needs to be serving for life. And he needs to be just the kind of guy who will say to the executive, stick it. <laughs> and you know, in England, where my wife comes from and to whom the Declaration of Independence is addressed, <laughs> <laughs> what's all that about, right? They forgot the lessons they learned. Charles the second was, Charles the first was dead, not around to remind them. So you see, separation of powers. Of the four that are left, Article I is about the legislature. Article II is about the executive branch. Article III is about the judges. And Article IV is mainly about the states. And by the way, those are the four places to which the government of the United, the, the people, the sovereign people of America, delegate their governing authorities. Now you may think, well, that still works, right? Except, of course, the states. But it doesn't, because you know what's happened that changes both the representative character of the government and separation of powers? Do you ever hear of the fourth branch of government? There's a guy who teaches at Harvard Law School. Clarman is his name. And you know, Robert Byrd got through a law that says that if you take money from the federal government and you're a college, you have to have an annual Constitution Day celebration, so all the colleges have them now. And so they all invite speakers to, to come and tell the students how bad the Constitution is. <laughs> and Mark Michael Klarman gave such a thing in 2010, I think it was. And he says, the Constitution's very evil. We can't follow it. He gives four reasons. But then one of the reasons, he says, is that the Constitution doesn't allow for this new fourth branch of government, the administrative state. In other words, the bureaucracy. And what's the point about these bureaucracies? By the way, why are they favored? Why are they the darling of modern liberalism? They don't represent anybody. And they hold all three of the powers of government in their own hands. If Boeing doesn't like the National Labor Relations Board telling it that it can't make Dreamliners in South Carolina, first of all, Obama, he's quoted in the paper, well, I can't do anything about it, it's a regulatory agency. He appointed you know, a majority on the board and doubtless they're doing what he wants, but he can't really make them, nor can anybody. But if Boeing wants to protest about it, they have to do, by the way, exactly what Hillsdale College had to do when it didn't like the Department of Education going after it in 1974. It had to sue the Department of Education. Now see, 
That's a great sounding phone. <laughs> we had to sue the Department of Education before, it was in health, education, and welfare, before a functionary appointed by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, taking his salary, enjoying his tenure from the same administration that had come against us. And you know what they did? They did exactly the kind of thing the king did, used to do to the colonists. They were located right here in the center of the universe in Washington, the District of Columbia, and we were located in Hillsdale, Michigan, so of course they held the hearings in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> and the reason is, hard to get farther away without going to California, and I guess the guys wanted, it might have been the winter, maybe they wanted to ski. And see, they're spending the taxpayers' money, and we're spending our own. And then we had to sue and fight with those guys for years and spend our money to get a ruling from one of their functionaries. And you know, didn't work out very well. Wonder of wonders. <laughs> you know, why has AT&T abandoned its attempt to take over whatever it is, T-Mobile? I don't even know if I want them to do that. I don't even care. What I care about is somebody has decided that many billion dollar thing, and who is that somebody? And where is the separation of powers? And where are the checks and balances? And doesn't that tell us something we could do now? Couldn't we take those three things? Limited government. Surely the government ought to be less than half of the economy. And representation. Surely this fourth branch of government should become representative. And separation of powers. Surely, all of these rules that they make and enforce, the making and the execution and the enforcement should not all be in the same hands. And by the way, if we could do those things, we would have our safety back. We wouldn't quite have our Constitution back, but we would have our safety back. And then we could work on the Constitution. And then we would be in following the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution together. And I'll tell you finally what the sanction is for those things. Come to find out when James Madison is explaining, in the most beautiful places where he explains why the Constitution is written the way it is. In one place he says, it is our reason that should be placed in control of the government. Our passions must be controlled by it. You know the best thing I'm doing this term? I'm teaching 17 students Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. We finished yesterday. It's just about the most fun people can have without getting arrested. <laughs> and it was, it was sublime fun to do with these young people, see? And they want to be good. They want to learn to have a good character. And the summation of that book could not be better made than saying, that it is the reason of man that must be placed in control of his passions. And Madison knew that, and he wrote the Constitution to be a reflection of that. And then in another place, about the reason why the government, and by the way, that means that we too, every one of us, we're all human. We can't just do whatever we want. We can't be given the power just to do that. But then, what about the government and its claims that it can be trusted with any power whatsoever and it can do? Today is the day when the ocean ceased rising and the planet began to heal. But that's a strain. Do you ever read the first paragraph of Bill Clinton's first inaugural address? We meet here in the bleak of winter, but by what we say and the faces we show the world, we can force the spring. Nature itself is asked to bend, <laughs> isn't it? Not the laws of nature and of nature's God. Madison says about nature that the reason the Constitution must be organized the way it must be is because we require to be governed because we are not angels. If men were angels, no government would be needed. But if angels were to govern men, 
neither internal nor external controls on the government would be necessary. I said that the Declaration of Independence begins in heaven. Doesn't that prove that the Constitution of the United States ends there? And doesn't that prove that in the end and finally, they are the same document? And we're going to get them back or we're going to lose our freedom and we're going to live like barbarians. But we're not going to let that happen. Thank you. Dr. Arndt, thank you so much for a lovely Christmas present. <laughs> thank you. Your lecture and your thinking. You alluded to, but maybe you would expound a bit on the problems of our representatives passing laws to which the bureaucracy then writes seven or eight hundred regulations to carry them out. Well, I, I, I uh, am, am uh, happy not to have ever witnessed this process, but I read about it. Um, the Obamacare bill and the Dodd-Frank financial regulation bill, I think they're both 2,000 pages long. We only have the evidence of a few explorers who claim actually to have read either of those acts. So let's say they're 2,000 pages long. Well, the agencies, they're, they're really only blueprint documents. And so the agencies are busy, in fact, right now, making the rules. And that's a vast log rolling process, right? Everybody shows up, now we're making rules, and what, what do industries do while that's going on? They support and they trade their support in exchange for a seat at the table. And then they make many, many, many more pages than the original 2,000 pages of rules. And I, I'll tell you how that, you know, my, my first uh, practical encounter of that was I was hired at, uh, by Bill Broadback at Hillsdale College in 2000, and I, uh, young and green and stupid, and I thought, uh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna read Title IV of the Higher Education Act, because that's the thing that we're giving up several million dollars a year not to have to abide by. I'd like to know what I get for the money, for not having the money. And so I called our lawyer. We, I don't think we still have him. I, I hope not. But uh, <laughs> for years and years, we kept a lobbyist in town whose job was to keep the government from giving us any money. It cost 30 or 40 grand a year to, keep, to make that happen. And a good, good person, too. And I called him up and I said, uh, you know, I want you to send me Title IV of the Higher Education Act if that is, in fact, the part that we are escaping by not taking all this dough. And he said, no use, no use in my sending it. And I said, why not? And he said, well, you won't be able to read it. You know, he's like Morell back there from Yale Law School, right? He thinks, it's, <laughs> thinks he's real smart. And I said, uh, I said, well, you know, I'm a reasonably intelligent man. Maybe I can read it. What are you, a lawyer? And, and he said, no, I said, I can't read it either. <laughs> we keep a specialist to read it. And she's actually the only person I ever met who can read it. Now, Madison says in the 73rd Federalist that if the laws are so voluminous or changeable that you can't read them, then it doesn't matter if they're made by the right process. And, you know, that's a feature of constitutional rule. I'll mention it. You know, one reason why Hillsdale College, you know, there's a bunch of people here who work at Hillsdale College. And, you know, I got no idea what they've been doing today, except probably they've been doing really well because they're very good people, and because at Hillsdale College, we all know what we're about. And we, and the reason is we keep it simple. You know, I said at the beginning there are three things. I had an accreditor say to me one time, I'd never been anywhere in 30 years where everybody could tell me what the mission statement was. How did you do that? <laughs> and I said, I didn't do it. And she said, who did it? And I said, well, we all did it. And she said, how'd you do it? And I said, we run the college out of it. It's simple, right? 
That's constitutional rule. It disperses power and it invites people to cooperate. It's the reason it works. It fits with human nature. Whereas we're proving it right now in America, you can't be rich enough to sustain a process like this. And I'll tell you one more thing. Go read the North, sorry, go read the Northwest Ordinance or go read the Homestead Act. Those are the two greatest pieces of statute law I ever read. One of them sets up the mechanism by which the United States of America will grow across the continent. And it's a unique document. It's a very beautiful document. And the Homestead Act gives away 10% of the land area of the United States to, for free to about 2 million people. The Homestead Act is about the length of the Declaration of Independence, about 1,350 words. Words, not pages, words. Given away that much land. The Northwest Ordinance is under 4,000 words. And, and you know, it sets up governments. It's very complex, right? But they thought it should be simple. And that's a, that's a key thing. We should learn the art of constitutional legislation again. We have lost that art. And so we can't imagine running anything without somebody off somewhere, heck and gone away, making a bunch of rules. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, in this uh, handout about Founders Key, it says that Franklin Roosevelt uh, was the first American statesman to sever the two documents. Well, what does that say about uh, Mr. Woodrow Wilson? Uh, okay, did you hear that? That's a good question. Um, what, uh, uh, Wilson was sort of against both of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Franklin Roosevelt, go read the Commonwealth Address. There's a, you know, there's, by the way, we're about to publish our Constitution Reader for anybody to buy. I think it's in, David, when's it going to be available? Do you know it's in? January. In January. The month of January, no more delays. We, we're slow as Christmas at doing fundamental things, but that's because they're fundamental. Um, and if you read it, you'll find that more than half of the documents in the Constitution Reader are written by people who are enemies of the Constitution of the United States, anti-federalists, confederates, such as that and progressives. And so Wilson's idea was it's all outmoded. The founding itself, the Declaration of Independence, he says, is uh, accountable to an age, is uh, written for an age accountable to Newton, but now we have Darwin, right? So it's obsolete, it's passe. And the Constitution is just, uh, is bad, every bit is bad, because it constructs a government the way you, he writes, the way you would construct an orrery. You turn a crank, and the planets go around the sun, you know, little chains where old people like me can remember these things. And, and a chain, and then the moon goes around the earth, right? That's an orrery. And he says our government's like an orrery, and it won't work. So we got to get rid of both of them. And what Roosevelt did, I, in, in my reading and the reading of many friends of mine who've been working on this for a long time, and I, I'll interrupt myself just to say this. Remember, there's an incredible work of recovery that's been going on for a long time. And one of its focal points is at Hillsdale College. And, you know, Claremont, California, across the street at Heritage, there are a lot of places where good work is being done to try to figure out how, how did it work? What was the point of it? What about all these charges against it? Are they true? What Roosevelt did, this scholarship says, and it's reflected in this Constitution Reader, you can read it, in original source stuff too, by the way, not what I say about it, Roosevelt figured out that the Declaration of Independence is a kind of magic. It's very powerful. And he sung its music. And he made it mean something different. And it won't work. It's just like Nancy Pelosi, who follows him, when she speaks of the Declaration with great reverence before the health care bill. But it won't support her reading of it, in, in my argument. And it's, but it's good she talks about it, by the way, because now it's a thing there to be debated. Let's have the debate. So that's my point. My point is, he condemned them both. This will be our last question. Uh, yes, sir. I know him well. I'll get him later. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to follow up on this gentleman's question here. 
authors like Gary will say that the link that you and I believe in between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was not uh, determined by the founders, that they didn't express that themselves, that it was actually Abraham Lincoln uh, that first made that sort of connection, and then from then on, constitutional scholars started talking about that. I'm wondering, in your book, The Founders' Keys, uh, do you uh, talk about that explicit connection, and do you provide any kind of um, excerpts from the works of the founders in that area, and, and perhaps also in the, in the constitution, constitutional reader? Well, I'll be darned. So I do. Um, uh, here's an example. There's a lot of, I, I, you know, isn't it boring when somebody says, well, my book does this and my book does that. So instead of telling you what the book does, I'll tell you a point. It, it happens to be in the book, but the point itself is what's beautiful. Uh, during the weeks, the three-week period when the Declaration of Independence was drafted and ratified or adopted, the state of Virginia was adopting the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Virginia Constitution. And George Mason and James Madison and Thomas Jefferson in absentia were on the committee. And so they're writing this, these two documents and they pass the two of them, the same body, with heavy overlap with the Continental Congress that was drafting and ratifying the Declaration. And the two documents, by the way, are very remarkable documents because both of them contain elements of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. They both contain some charges against the king, and they both contain universal statements of how government has to be organized to be safe. And by the way, James Madison, of later fame, was on the committee that wrote it. And the point is, the Virginia Constitution is not nearly as good as the Constitution of the United States, in just exactly the way that a first effort is not as good as the real McCoy. And Madison himself never, of course, disavowed. And Jefferson intervened in the Virginia Con Convention only to make the separation of powers stronger. He kept writing letters saying, you can't have it this, t you can't have it this close. You gotta, have, you gotta have these devices. Also, he was for a broader suffrage than they, the very broad suffrage that they adopted. So the point is, you just have to ignore things like that because I'm saying not only are these two documents, the Declaration of Rights and the Constitution, being written as the same time as the Declaration of Independence, and they're like the Constitution, but they're also just like each other, and they overlap extensively. So where does that come from? Because you know, Gary Wills does say that about Abraham Lincoln, but you know who never says that? Abraham Lincoln never says that. In other words, he doesn't say, ha, huh, I'm the one that figured out. He says, that's how it was. And come to find out, go look. I can't find any way. Now, Gordon Wood is a very great historian. With a mistake or two, right? But he, he what he thinks, and see, there is something that's added in the Constitutional Convention that's really great. I mean, it's because the, what's your life like? I'll tell you what mine's like. I first read the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle in 1974. And I'm no, you know, there are people who know more about it than I do. But I love it very much, and I've been reading it all that time. And I know a lot about it now. And I've just taught it for the third time. And you know, we, we actually had, the class and I had two extra classes. We, we actually had scheduled four extra classes, but we couldn't fit them in. And since, in my way of teaching, because I have to travel so much, every class is a week, we went to class for two extra weeks. And we regretted, one time we had class at seven o'clock in the morning over breakfast. And we regretted we didn't have more time. Now my point is, I'm better at that than I was. That's how my life works. I bet yours works that way too. I bet James Madison's worked that way too. And so it's very possible that the truth is what he said it was, and that is, if the Constitution is different in some ways, and it is, than, than the Virginia Constitution, maybe it's because he'd been thinking for 11 years.
and he'd gathered some experience because he says it's the same thing in principle, and he says twice in the Federalist Papers that the purpose of the Constitution is to secure a Republican form of government and our individual rights, and in the saying of that, he quotes the Declaration of Independence. And you know, he and Thomas Jefferson had one of the closest political friendships in all of human history. So come to find out, there's a fact or two on the point. And, and I don't know of the facts against the point. Thank you all.